Hi guys, it's Claire Nocti. I'm so excited to be introducing a new series today where again I'm going to let a timeless fairy tale, this time Beauty and the Beast, lead us into profound mysteries illuminated by revealing and decoding the astrological patterns hidden below the surface. This series of videos will explore two interrelated nakshatras and their lording planet types in depth, one which arose for Belle and the other for Beast. These archetypal characters, the powers and traits their nakshatras grant them opens up countless connections that extend into many broad related themes that this series will cover. Now with that, I'll get started on this journey into the fascinating nakshatra of beauty and her goodness and the unique form of dominance and authority she holds over the cosmic beast in all his grotesque and surreal forms. In this video, I will follow her, the brave and compassionate archetype of Belle, as our guiding figure, as the personification of this perhaps misunderstood lunar mansion deep into the jungles of Mula Nakshatra. I'm here to tell you a very strange story in which 17 of our party suffered horrible deaths. Their lives lost in pursuit of a savage beast. A monstrous aberration of nature. But even the meanest brute can be tamed. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, as you will see, the beast was no match for the charms of a girl. And lo, the beast looked upon the face of beauty, and beauty stayed his hand. And from that day forward, he was his one dead. Just needs a firm hand, is all. Think you've got an admirer. Perhaps the traditional association of Mula that arose most strongly, metaphorically and literally, in this vast research was its Ankusha symbol, the elephant goad, the ancient tool for training the largest land mammal. With the aversive, prodding poker and the hook, the Ankusha grants the one who wields it the ability to command this massive animal force and incentivize it into directed action. The goad is a potent symbol of Mula's cosmic role, the wielding of primal power both within and without, the harnessing of brawn to charge forcefully towards a divinely inspired goal. This inherent primal power is also indicated by another of this nakshatra's symbols, the swishing tail of the king of the jungle, the lion. Cosmically holding the elephant goad, being symbolically able to train and command undomesticated wild forces, immediately shows a special form of strength over which these natives have possession. In the Vimshatari system, Mula is the height and refinement expression of Ketu, the South Node. According to Parashara, a planetary skill of Ketu is expertise in working with elephants. How do I look? You two are made for each other. And K2 is often associated with professions that involve the study of animals such as zoology. She really is beautiful. I'd just like to kiss her on the lips. Hey, Farley, look at this great, big, beautiful beast. How can you not like something like that? can't fake these emotions. K2 is the enigmatic shadow planet whose mythological headlessness represents the intangible, instinctual knowledge and wisdom embedded in the physical body. Whack! He's beaten my hand, grabbed it, and just pulled straight back into the water. Luckily enough, all of my instincts came together. I went loose. I didn't go rigid. If I had gone rigid and resisted, whoo, he'd have pulled my arm right out at the socket. He dragged me into the water. I spun in the air instinctively, and as I hit the water, whack, I landed on his head. K2 rules are past lives and storehouse of experiences, and so the area he has placed in our chart is where we animalistically mark our territory with his flag symbol. We have such saturation in the realm where he's placed that it's essentially ingrained in our reflexes and drives. We need little to no intervention of the roving analytical mind to function in the area of our K2, but instead do so instinctually, moved by the unconscious, and with all the raw power, natural rhythm, and firm grounding of deep familiarity. Here, one has the potential to move with all the force of the body and without the fear, dispersion, error, or inhibition of the head. K2's strength in one's chart is then important because he has the potential for all the good and bad torment in a wild creature. My lord was like a wild animal that had been kept 
too long. Like the past and tradition which he rules, he's unchanging, just as the base nature of a tiger differs from that of an antelope, yet scarcely can be altered in any way. For animals, there is no Rahu head force commanding the animal's direction into new, unfamiliar territory. As the power and inertia of the past, he can create obstacles to development and transformation. When our inner animal is untamed then, our own K2 can be unpredictable and volatile. These wild animals are very unpredictable. Remember your training and do exactly as I say. Or heavy, lazy, and stagnating. In this way, the various megafauna prominently present in Mula artworks symbolize the difficulty and danger in trying to subdue or control such unruly and formidable forces, as well as the potential unmatched personal power, inspired action, and divine protection that comes through doing so. So, those born under this pinnacle K2 rolled nakshatra have special control over animals in these stories, but it is due to their strong connection to their own instincts and automatic unconscious processes. They flow with the language and laws of impulsivity, fearlessness, come get me, come on. That's it, come on. an uninhibited reflex that can cause these natives to struggle in the civilized world in ways I've explored and will explore more. Please God. Don't let me die. But in the animal kingdom would cause them to rise to the highest ranks. His roar is long and loud. A god associated with Ketu is the elephant-headed Ganesha, who holds an Ankusha, representing the need for one on the path of liberation to tame and control their own ignorance. In Buddhist literature, the training of the mind is likened to training a wild elephant. To do so, it's written, one must use the tether of mindfulness and the goad of introspection. Silence! K2 is the planet ruling liberation and the stream of insight that comes from the inner world, through which we can tap into the changeless state of universal truth, Satya. As the significator of liberation, K2 is linked to the crown center, and Mula's function specifically is aligned with the crown's correlating sphere on the tree of life, Keter. The Sahasrara chakra represents the energetic state of liberated beings, those with the highest authority. The Muladhara chakra, whose animal is the elephant, is where our dormant life force, our animal-based nature, resides. It represents raw physical power, yet is also said to indicate one who lacks self-control or the ability to direct oneself like an animal. The relationship between the Sahasrara and Muladhara and Keter and Malkut can be seen as two sides of the same coin. The roots of Keter have dominion over the soil of Malkut. The crown represents the mastery and control of the base impulses of the Muladhara. Mula has dominion over the animal kingdom due to its ability to access, integrate, and direct all the powers of the animal world and body without the ignorance and lack of control of this Muladhara consciousness. It's important to understand the more practical applications of what these films are symbolizing in daily life and human interaction. <laughs> Abo, it's okay. Femi Inu on station. Mula's innate animal dominance extends to obtaining control over the primal animal impulses within the people around them. The more unintegrated or unaware one is of their own animal impulses, the more then they'll feel an unconscious sense of submission to K2 rolled individuals and especially Mula natives around them. So we'll just take it nice and easy and we'll see how well he responds to my commands despite what their logical or rational mind may think. This is something I'll explore the potential negatives behind in part three. We're all gonna die tonight. Isn't that right? Yes, sir! Of course, Mula means and is symbolized by roots, alluding to its abilities here to see to the base nature of things as well as to pull things up from their roots. Beyond the capacity of all other nakshatras, Mula natives are the uprooters, tangibly diving into this Muladhara consciousness of others. Our mission is to follow these roots until we reach the heart of Pando and stop whatever's harming it. Becoming responsible for taming, subduing, or destroying inner and outter beastliness. I'll teach that animal some manners. All for the ultimate restoration of goodness and peace. Don't worry. <coughs> He's dead. 
Sun is the king, but is the second hottest planet. K2 is the hottest planet of all, and those born in this nakshatra stationed in this chakra possess a special burning, seemingly wild kind of authority that goes beyond the rational and human, and immediately reaches all the way to the most headless, primordial, undomesticated depths of a person. Harnessing this power, Mula is given the cosmic task of protecting the civilized, being a bridge between humans and the animal world. They had always lived in the borderland anyway, somewhere between this world and the other. Or between people in society and their inward animal nature. Well, you should learn to control your temper. Out of the way, Dobie! The I Ching contains a metaphor, that of the pigs and fishes. The divinatory text uses this phrase to refer to the unintelligent forces that are therefore the hardest to control and most unresponsive to direction. This, of course, can be alluding to specific humans or situations and would scarcely apply in questioners' lives as relating only to actual animals. Hexagram 61 indicates, I quote, Pigs and fishes are dumb animals and therefore immensely difficult to influence. If this is the arising hexagram, the text advises, the force of inner truth must grow great indeed before its influence can extend to such creatures. That was amazing. Mind over matter. <laughs> Oh, Bushman's trick. Here in this Song Fu hexagram aptly called Centering in Inner Truth, Mula's cosmic place is beautifully expressed. To the mind that is still. The whole universe surrenders. One must be in touch with inner truth and the purity of their true nature, their storehouse of power that is K2, in order to have any control over the most untamable people or forces of reality. Satya is equated with and considered necessary to the concept of Rita, cosmic order and harmony. With Ankusha in hand and one's divine instinct fueling the movement, Mola natives are granted the cosmic authority to wield destructive, violent forces for good. That's right. Let's kick some ass. To help them in their hunt against that which acts against the cosmic order. I will explore much more in this series how Mula's presiding goddess, Nirati, is alluded to in ancient texts as a manifestation of a righteous anger against those who violate the laws of nature. She was said to have been born from Himsa and Adharma, representing the clashing of violence against falsehood, and thus this nakshatra uses nature's unmatched violent power to restore truth. In art, this special power is channeled over and over by the imagery of a Mola native standing strong with all the looming power of a massive beast behind them, showing in different cases either their unique capacity to hunt or subdue such a force or their attainment of this beast as loyal to them exclusively. So starting with that frame of reference, it begins to become more clear why the cosmic bell with the protective and adoring silhouette of beast behind her streams from the Mola mind. The oldest known variant of this popular fairy tale was an original story published in 1740 by Gabrielle de Villeneuve, who can herself have had Mula Moon. In 1991, Disney greatly popularized and restructured the tale with their animated version. Seeking to create a more dimensional, empowered Belle, they hired the first woman to write an animated feature, the Mula Sun screenwriter Linda Wolverton, along with the key story artist Brenda Chapman with Mula Moon. Together, they crafted the storyline, motifs, and characters that the modern collective is most familiar with. And for this video, I will largely follow this familiar and iconic Wolverton version of Belle and her story. With Belle, she had to be an intellectual, she had to not be about her beauty, you know, she had to be the, the proactive one. The Belle that Wolverton created is a book-loving, intelligent, and brave young woman who lives with her father in a small French town. The Disney animation team intuitively felt the Mula energies on the story, and specifically on the Belle archetype, as they modeled her character in many ways, such as hairstyle and clothing, after the Mula Moon Judy Garland's portrayal of a young woman surrounded by the friendship of once human beast-like creatures in The Wizard of Oz. Even the voice actress was chosen specifically, as the director noted her voice had a unique tone with, I quote, a little bit of Judy Garland, his ideal dark and creepy. Take me instead. In the 2017 live action, this nakshatra's energies held on and came through even more markedly, with Mola Moon Emma Watson stepping into this iconic role and bringing a further increased level of independence and bravery to the character. You've taken me as your prisoner and now you want to have dinner with me? Are you insane? 
The 2014 French live-action team made the same intuitive casting choice with Moulin Moon Lea Seydoux as Belle. Determined to unravel the mysteries of the beast, she became lost in a labyrinth of corridors and ramshackle passageways with, at all times, the eerie sensation of being followed. Just as the creators of the 2009 Australian version did by casting Estella Warren with Moulin Sun. You will never come back. Of course I will. Why? What do you mean, why? You don't have to pretend you want to see me again. Mula native's Emily de Raven. Emily possesses all the qualities that we need. She's beautiful. She resembles Belle. She's also got this wonderful, vulnerable side and this great strength to her. Joyce Taylor. She asks us to love that. <laughs> yes. Love that. Fran Drescher, Vanessa Williams. Have you ever been around a beast like me before? You're right, I've never been around someone like you before. Now that I am, is there any reason why we can't be friends? And Amy Jackson are other Belle versions who have or can have this nakshatra. During a journey, Belle's father gets lost in the forest and unknowingly seeks refuge in the enchanted, deteriorating castle of a terrifying humanoid beast who imprisons him for picking a rose he'd intended to bring to Belle. When her father's horse returns alone, she bravely sets out into the woods to search for him, finding her father imprisoned in the castle dungeon. To secure his release, she offers herself as captive in his place. Belle is now alone, essentially in the wild, with only a terrifying beast as company. And this lays the groundwork for the beginning of the cosmic Mola story, told and enacted over and over by these natives over the centuries. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my! Mula in the previous nakshatra, Jeshta, form a Gandanta Nadand, a heavy and transformative transition point where both Rashi and nakshatra shift together. Of the three Gandanta points, it is this one often said to be the most difficult as it is the entryway to the third and final stage of nakshatras, the portion devoted to obtaining liberation. In each nakshatra stage sequence, the nine planets have a chance to enact their will in time and space, teaching their lesson at increasingly high octaves. For example, I've explored before how Venus rolled nakshatras come in at moments of judgment or harvest. Jupiter rolled nakshatras are linked to major spiritual trials and temptations. Those rolled by Mercury complete each sequence, as Mercury is the most material and tangible amongst the planets, showing the most physical manifestation of our efforts. Jaishta then deals with the solid attainment of all the goals of stage 2, the crystallized rewards coming from firmly mastering material work and conquering rivals. Thus, this is the billionaire nakshatra of worldly power. It's linked as well to Ketu's exaltation here, showing you're standing on all of your work in the past, so this leads to wealth. You've accumulated the time and energy to focus on spiritual topics, wealth no longer being an issue, being debt-free. On the other side of the knot comes the Ketu-ruled nakshatras, who begin each sequence. They hold the buried knowledge of the past stage deeply now rooted within us, and under Ketu's initiating control, we learn what we'll be grappling with over the coming sequence. Here, like the aces in the tarot, we realign with all the pure energy and force of our instinctual inner nature, which, if properly accessed. Ow! becomes our best chance moving forward of being grounded and protected in the new stages and trials to come. This transition point is the approach of the gateway to the pure sanctuary of spiritual knowledge, the cathedral adorned with fearsome gargoyles, grotesque composite beings of all kinds. They represent the mystery of nature, Maya shrouding, ensnaring, terrifying power, which averts the impure from progressing on the spiritual path, and thus these forces keep the sanctuary from being defiled. Mula initiates Sagittarius, the natural ninth house called Dharma Bhava, and it's here where we must assert our power, not through trials in civilization, but through displaying the connection to inner truth that conquers even the most wild and untamable inner and outer forces. Uh-oh, he's losing it. Oh dear. Only with perfect alignment with our K2, trust in our own nature and instincts, connecting to what is true and inherent to us in our purpose. A great man doesn't seek to lead, he's called to it. 
and he answers. Do we snap into inspired action, stability, and inner guidance that will protect us on our challenging journey forward, where we will need to harness both the power of the body and the mind? In this way, Mula films are packed with a rich symbolism of an individual entering the jungle alone, the territory of the beast. Do you suppose we'll meet any wild animals? Mm, we might. As an initiatory form of testing their inner power and personal purity against nature's culling, here they are assessed not by their adherence to man-made laws, but their grip on the laws of the jungle in the hands of Mother Nature. The myth of Matsya, the Ketu avatar of Vishnu, alludes to the Indian Law of the Fishes, an equivalent to the Western Law of the Jungle, according to mythologist Yves Bonifoy. Rules of the jungle. You knew that the other lions would kill him to protect their pride. Every animal got rule. I don't think it eats you if you don't look at them. In most traditional instances, this jungle test includes the need to hunt a dangerous animal. He's a man killer. He's the whole time. <laughs> bringing it back to one's people as an affirmative trophy of their place atop her jungle hierarchy. The Hydra's heads, your majesty. Proving their unique capacity for providing for and protecting their community from nature's destructive forces. I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna lure the wolves out of the room. When they leave, lock the door. Good luck. Without the buffering protection of those who have special spiritual control over nature's forces, both outside of and within human beings, there can be no secure social order, civilization, or peace. Animal instinct lives in us all. It's by its own set of laws, laws of the jungle. Those who fall negatively under their animal instincts and step outside the laws of peaceful societal order can only be hunted and destroyed by the uprooters who have the personal purity to intervene using jungle law and instinct, applied in alignment with truth and harmony. This is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky. The wolf that keeps them may prosper, but the wolf that breaks it will die. It is this initial experience in the jungle that proves that they have the purity and ability to harness their own instincts without being overcome by them, which secures them to their unique purpose, rolling over such forces in their environment. It's it! Aligning with this entry into the jungle, in the iconic tale of King Kong, a young actress, Anne Darrow, travels with a film crew to the mysterious Skull Island, a lost land full of overgrown creatures and ancient dinosaurs. Somewhere out there is a woman born to play this role, and as soon as I saw you, I knew it was always going to be you. On Skull Island, Anne is kidnapped by the local people and offered like Belle to a beast. Behold her terror as she is offered up to the mighty Kong! A monstrous 20-foot gorilla who carries her away in his hand and keeps her captive. You will be mine! Stay here! Don't move! In 1933's original version, she was played by the Moon Moon native Fay Ray. Miss Darrow's story, Beauty and the Beast, huh? That's it. Play up that angle. Beauty and the Beast. It was then Mula Moon Naomi Watts who reprised the role in the 2005 version, deepening the relationship to Kong in various ways. Monster Island starring the Mula Ascendant native Carmen Electra and the host starring the Mula Moon native Go Ah Sung both follow a very similar pattern. The Mula woman is carried away by a monstrous man-eating creature, yet either due to his attraction to or unconscious respect or recognition of Mula's power, the beast spares her, opting instead to keep her captive. This mirrors the beginning of the myth of Psyche and Eros, the mythological basis for both Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast. These fairy tales begin with this myth, but each goes in different directions and with different focuses. Cinderella, as I explored, focuses on Prince Charming's wealth as a metaphor for Eros's powerful ability to elevate and transform Psyche to godhood, and Beauty and the Beast lingers much more with the idea of a maiden's experience being offered to a monstrous, untamed being. Oh, I get it, I get it. Not Cinderella. Little Red Riding Hood now, huh? Hey, whatever kinky game you want to play, I am in. Ow! Ow, ow, ow! Arr. And the special power that feminine goddess energy, beauty, and harmony has over such grotesque forces. There the beast, and here the beauty. She has lived through an experience no other woman ever dreamed of. 
A big hand, folks, for the bravest girl I've ever met. So Cinderella, or Uttara Bajapada, represents a best-case scenario in marriage blessed by Juno, while Beauty and the Beast has more to do with the taming or refining that most women have to deal with in less-than-perfect unions, which I'll explore more in part two. This general encounter is also shown in the Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale, also most typically enacted by K2 Nakshatra women. However, for reasons I'll explore in part 3, that particular version is even more rooted in Maga than Mula. He asked her where she was going. To my granny's house, she said. Another crucial Mula mythological connection along this same vein is that of the labors of Hercules, the god of strength and heroes, in which he must perform 12 trials on his path to regaining godhood. It was the Mula Moon native Tate Donovan who voiced Hercules in the Disney animation I happen to be a hero! With his trainer in all things heroic, Phil, being voiced by the Mula Ascendant native Danny DeVito. What are you doing? Get your sword! Mula Moon Dwayne Johnson then portrayed Hercules in the 2014 live action of The Myth. Hercules. A retelling which was based on a graphic novel by Steve Moore, also a Mula Moon native. Nearly all of Hercules' labors involved the killing, driving out, or capturing of indestructible beasts and monsters. I've beaten every single monster I've come up against. I'm I'm an action figure! Such as the slaying of the giant Nemean lion. This was no ordinary beast. It had a hide so tough no weapon could penetrate it. And the nine-headed hydra, the shooting of the man-eating birds of the Stymphalian marshes, the capture of the mad bull that terrorized the island of Crete. But even this monster was no match for the son of Zeus. The wild boar of Mount Arimanthus and the man-eating mares of King Diomedes and the three-headed monstrous dog Cerberus. The very first film role of the Mula Moon Arnold Schwarzenegger was Hercules in New York, in which the demigod comes to Earth, falls in love, and battles a violent bear who has escaped from the zoo. The old ones say we Spartans are descended from Hercules himself. Bold Leonidas gives testament to our bloodline. The movie 300 was written by the Mula Moon native Frank Miller and stars Mula Moon Gerard Butler as Leonidas, King of Sparta. His wife, the courageous Queen of Sparta, is also played by a Mula Moon native, Lena Headey, and is parodied by Mula Ascendant Carmen Electra in Meet the Spartans. 300 begins with the scene of Leonidas as a young boy, sent into nature to assess his strength, tossed into the wild, left to pit his wits and will against nature's fury. It was his initiation. And eventually set against a terrifying wolf. His hands are steady. His form. Perfect. He returns to his people with the wolf's head in his hand and its fur strewn around his shoulders, just as Hercules is traditionally shown triumphantly adorned in the fur of the fearsome Nemean lion. This jungle experience was Leonidas' test and lesson on accessing the fierce instinctual power within him to become king. And this is shown to be what later allows for his brave displays of primal power against his grotesque enemies in battle, an army of beasts, monsters, and beastly humans from whom he protects his people. It's been more than 30 years since the wolf in the winter cold. Now, as then, a beast approaches. This beast is made of men and horses. Swords and spears! Just as Dwayne Johnson's Hercules does. Schwarzenegger famously starred in Predator, a movie in which he leads a military rescue team into the jungles of Central America. After finding a string of dead bodies, the crew discovers they are being hunted by a brutal creature with superhuman strength. If it bleeds, we can kill it. It kills his crew one by one, but the Mula native is more attuned to it. Don't! Leave it! He didn't kill you because you weren't armed. No sport. He studies it carefully and determines how to harness what is available to him in nature to destroy it when his modern weapons have no effect, removing the threat when others cannot. The most recent addition to this franchise was 2022's Prey, fascinatingly also starring a Mula Moon native, this time Amber Midthunder as Naru, a Comanche healer who desires to be a powerful hunter for her community. To prove herself, she must traditionally battle a mountain lion as a form of initiation. It's time, Naru. When the lion comes, we tell that thing, this is as far as you go. You've never faced a lion. Its mouth. Full of teeth like arrows. Claws of black steel. 
fur as dark night. Ready to tear your flesh and crush your bones. Instead, during this hunt, she encounters the same species of alien hunting her people. I saw what left those tracks. A bear? There was a bear, but there was something else, and it was huge. I couldn't see it until it was covered in blood, but it looked like, like a moot beats. You saw a monster from a children's story? When no one else in her party is attuned to it or can kill it, it's she who bravely and with deep, fearless fixity, like Schwarzenegger, stalks, studies, and eventually kills it by using its own strengths against it, protecting her tribe. Like Hercules in Leonidas, Naru returns heroically and triumphantly to her people with its head swinging from her hand. Both films intuitively include major hunting moments with the mula native positioned in front of a root system. The juxtaposition of the uprooted tree and the beast that's about to be killed conveys this idea of mula as that which destroys, uproots, negative destructive forces acting out of alignment with the cosmic order. This is as far as you go. No more. The film The Monster, written and directed by Mula Moon Brian Bertino, follows a similar pattern, both beginning in nearly identical ways. My mom tells me there's no such thing as monsters, but she is wrong. A long time ago, it is said, a monster came here. A little girl with Mula Ascendant gets trapped in the woods with her mother after a car accident, and they too are stalked by a terrifying monster. It's the little Mula girl who senses the extent of the threat when others do not. Dogs don't got teeth like this. Their teeth are small. Instinctually alerted to the danger, and who also ultimately slays the beast who has killed her mother. She exits the forest into the sunlight as an initiatory symbol of her having lost her childlike innocence to the struggle and arising now in strength and fearlessness. My mom tells me there's no such thing as monsters, but she is wrong. I'm not afraid anymore. The film The Edge follows this Gandanta stage perfectly, where one must test their inner power against beings that don't possess any form of artificial restraint. The bookish billionaire Charles Morse, played by Mula Moon Anthony Hopkins, is stranded in the Alaskan wilderness stalked by a man-eating bear. In the wild, he's forced to test whether he can apply his book knowledge and intelligence to surviving in nature. You can't kill the bear, Charles. He's ahead of us all the time. It's like he's reading our minds. He's stalking us, for God's sakes! He I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it! I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it again! I'm gonna kill the bear. And again! Spear, bait, induce a charge. Bear charges. As he falls, he impales himself on the spear. Eventually, by studying the beast's nature in order to predict its actions, he succeeds in killing it. Come on, Gabby! Gabby, come in, Come on! Come on, come on, come on. Come on, kill me! I'm here! Come on, come on! No! Come on! Just as in the other films, he leaves the jungle ornamented in this bear fur and with its tooth as a necklace. Only a hero may wear this, but to become a hero, you must grow strong. Is this the Nemean lion's tooth? It is. A sign of his accomplishment in a battle against nature's unhinged destruction. <laughs> In Legends of the Fall, Mula's son Brad Pitt stars as Tristan. When he was a young boy, he also is shown seeking out his own initiatory experience as a hunter, desiring to energetically connect with a predator. Did you know that Indian boys used to run up to the bear and slap him? Count Ku on him as a test of manhood? He goes into the woods and touches a sleeping grizzly bear, who he retrieves a claw from. You will one say, when a man and an animal have spilled each other's blood, they become one. This experience is shown to change him. The essence of the bear is alluded to lie within him for the rest of the story, ready to awaken at any time. I think it was the bear's voice you heard deep inside him, growling low of dark, secret places. The Serpent and the Rainbow, directed by the Mula Ascendant native Wes Craven, features Mula's son Bill Pullman as a traveler who meets with a shaman and embarks on a journey in the Amazon to encounter his spirit animal, a jaguar. At first fearing the jaguar, eventually he integrates it into himself and later uses its strength to overcome spiritual and astral trials. Hybrid, starring the Mula's son, Corey Monteith, includes a similar quest for accessing the power of his inner animal harmoniously. When an Ojibwe boy reaches puberty, he goes through a rite of passage, a vision that would help identify his purpose. I had a vision, my eyes were wide open. And bring meaning to his life. He connects with his animal spirit, an eagle, a bear, 
war. This presence becomes his guardian, but it's more than that. The young man is actually integrating with the animal, man and nature, working as one. In Dances with Wolves, written by a Mula ascendant native, a soldier stranded alone in the frontier slowly wins the protective love of a wild wolf circling his fort, who alerts him to any danger, and due to this, he is given the name Dances with Wolves by the Lakota tribe nearby. Many of these works were largely influenced by the popularity of neo-shamanism, especially in the 80s and 90s. 1985. Arrive at the clearing of the shaman Anhango, regarded as the most powerful spiritual man in the Amazon. Which included the idea of ally animals, or the tonal animal within. By awakening, goading, and harnessing this primal unconscious aspect of the self, the individual is empowered to navigate their lives with inspired intention, guided by their inner voice and their own instincts towards fulfilling their purpose. Because this process takes place at the Mula threshold cosmically, it makes sense that it was two Mula natives, Carlos Castaneda and Michael Harner, who are known for popularizing such conceptions in the modern collective. Totem animals were especially common in the mythopoetic men's movement, emphasizing what they refer to as primal masculinity. Hercules fists have been dipped in the blood of a hydra! Please don't do anyone but him! Its most well-known text was Iron John by the Mula Sun native Robert Bly, an exegesis of the fairy tale of that name by the Brothers Grimm. The tale begins with a king's huntsmen disappearing one by one into the forest. Determined to find the cause, the king sends out a hunting party. They discover and capture a hair-covered wild man, Iron John, living in the lake. The king locks him in a cage as a curiosity, but his son, the prince, slowly begins to befriend him. Eventually, the prince frees him from the cage and follows him back into the woods. He finds out that Iron John is a powerful and magical being guarding many treasures. The prince gains the ability to call upon the beastly man anytime he needs to overcome a challenge, and with this foundational support which represents his access to his inner animal instinct, Some people hear their own inner voices with great clearness. They live by what they hear. Such people become crazy, they become legend. Climb up, rise. He rises to success as a warrior and a ruler. And so the boy, given up for dead, returns to his people. A king! Similarly, in Dwayne Johnson's Hercules, his most valued soldier was a beastly feral man that others rejected but that he befriended and was able to place under his taming command. Tydeus is my most loyal warrior. When I found him, he was more animal than human. In order to show how Mula natives have such special knowledge of and mastery over the animal kingdom, most jungle exploration stories also star Mula natives, usually as some form of jungle guide, the one who knows the way of the animals and of nature and therefore can protect the rest of the party. That real respect and appreciation that he had with wildlife and that ability to read animals and understand them. In The African Queen, the Mula's son native Humphrey Bogart plays a skipper guiding and protecting a woman through a jungle river. But don't go bumping into no hippo. Make them awful, man. This film largely inspired Jungle Cruise, starring Dwayne Johnson in a similar jungle skipper role. Tequila will be ready first thing in the morning. Oh, no, Frank owes me money. We're going to depart in 10 minutes. <laughs> now it gets dark in two hours. Does it? What, now, miss? Yes, now. Well, there ain't two hours of daylight left, miss. I'll have to get the old kettle to boiling and... Well, do so, Mr. Owner who markets his protective power to potential customers by fighting a jaguar, but it's revealed that he actually has the wild animal completely tamed. You're good, Proxima. You're a good girl. Memes joke about Dwayne Johnson's constant presence in jungle films. Welcome to another Dwayne Johnson movie. Are you ready? Where I am fighting enemies, and I'm trapped in the jungle. Whoa, 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 whoa. But then I save the jungle and make it to the city. That's why he's here! But then I get kidnapped again, and I'm in the jungle. But then I wake up and realize it was all a dream. This is where the good part starts. I wake up in the jungle. Such a role is also present in Congo, starring Mula's son, Ernie Hudson. I'm taking a safari into the Barunga region of the Congo. As the knowledgeable and physically capable safari guide. But you should know this is a damn dangerous place, and people die here very easily. Know this about the jungle. Everything that you see wants to kill you. 
who protects them from various animals. Back, back, back! Sean, get behind me! In the film Jungle, it is Mula Moon Thomas Kretschmann who leads a party of young travelers into the wilds of Bolivia. There's nothing like the jungle at night. Don't worry, no one stops in the jungle. In the jungle, the rivers are your best friends. Carl says, there's no time in the jungle. Oh. Can't get lost in the jungle. Can't starve in the jungle. Invincible, yeah. It's gonna be easy. Yeah. 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 How did you know it was gonna rain? I know everything. Yeah, I bet you can talk to the animals too, yeah? To monkeys I can. It's okay. Come. Romancing the Stone stars Mula Moon Michael Douglas as the rugged guide leading Kathleen Turner, also with Mula Moon, through the Colombian jungle. Most recently was the film The Lost City, an unofficial remake of Romancing the Stone. The, I quote, hunky guy who knows the jungle, Michael Douglas's character Jack, was reprised by Mula Brad Pitt. This kind of special knowledge regarding obsession with and also empathy or respect towards Earth's most powerful creatures. The apex predator of the world. Is seen in case study examples in the Mula Ascendant native Steve Irwin called the Crocodile Hunter. He had this amazing understanding of all wildlife behaviour. In turn, because he could understand the animals, the animals were always far more comfortable with Steve as well. He began his career by willingly going out into the Australian bush to wrangle, capture, and transport crocodiles who would be in danger from poachers in the areas they were located. It's really hard to express how much I love him, but seriously, if I could kiss him on the lips, I would. He's been called a real-life crocodile dundee, referring to the crocodile hunter, same exact type of role, of the mula ascendant native of Steve Hogan in the 80s Crocodile Dundee series. Yeah, see a croc will grab you, take it down to the bottom of the water. As he leads the female protagonist through the wild in a strikingly similar way to romancing the stone. I mean, if you had any kind of manners, if you... Ah! Uh, uh, Aborigines, well, like all God's creatures, they just want the right to roam across the earth and be left in peace. In both cases, he grabs or kills a snake threatening her, something mimicking the power alluded to in Hercules' myth. As well as is shown in Schwarzenegger's Conan the Barbarian, where he is the hero able to kill a giant threatening snake when others cannot. This huge red-bellied black snake showed up behind the same bush I had chosen, and I don't know why I didn't get bitten, but I came running out saying, help. <laughs> It's fascinating how, in real life, mirroring these fictional works, footage of Steve Irwin on his honeymoon shows the way he saved his wife from a poisonous snake in the Australian outback. Take it easy, black snake. You gotta get out of my campsite. You can't bite my wife. He managed to wrangle the snake, and it was a very memorable moment. And, and how cool when your husband actually saves your life. Similarly, it's the inspiration of his Mula jungle guide. Men of action. <laughs> that inspires Daniel Radcliffe's character to have the courage to kill a snake for his survival when he's lost and stranded. Oh. Traditionally, K2 is believed to ward off illnesses arising from poison-like snake bites. Oh, it's a King Brown. Poisonous? Oh, you're deadly. Not bad eating. Goddamn Bushmaster. Is it uh, poisonous? Yeah. But very tasty. Or the poison that emerged from the ocean of milk, like the goddess Tara linked to Ketu. I quote, Tara was invoked to allay all kinds of fears arising from lions, elephants, fire, serpents, Let me hold submerging waters, and ghosts. Are there any more of those around? Oh, maybe the odd one, you know, late at night, but stick close to me, you'll be alright. This initiatory experience in the jungle, then, of facing nature's most destructive creatures is not so much the challenge of Mula, but an idea ingrained within Mula inherently that essentially begins its story. Living right in the bush, I became at one with nature. And I think those years in the bush trying to help crocodiles 
built Steve Irwin. By depicting the understanding that the native has the brute, monstrous, wildly destructive power of nature at their cosmic command, they've pushed themselves into dangerous natural territory and succeeded to emerge in the third stage. The height of Ketu is a butcher cast in Tikshna, sharp nakshatra, and it relates to the power one can obtain through interaction with animals in a cosmically lawful manner and using those obtained powers within and without to protect civilization. And Mr. Homoka here had to be carried out of the jungle by, as I remember it, me. Throughout history, the idea that if one could stalk and kill a bear, for example, meant they could provide a bear's warmth for their people through obtaining his fur, a bear's fat and strength for their people through having his hearty meat, and hence could drive the community upwards in health and vitality. Delay killed the monarch! He did not let go of the net! He was the only one! In a literal sense, interacting with the bear trains one's own brute strength and courage, and therefore the hunter grows in primal power as he overcomes it within the animal. I like how Steve could single-handedly wrangle anything. I quote mythologist Anna Chilariu, Greek tradition knows of shape-shifting warriors such as the wolf people, the long-haired Archeans, and Myrmidons found in the Iliad. Young men wearing animal skins were thought to essentially become that animal, to assume its nature, to acquire its animal force and qualities. Care to inspect the armor of Hercules? Lino thorax, hewn from the skin of the Aramanthian boar. It's indestructible. This Chris knife was given to me by my great aunt. It's made from a tooth of Shai Halud, the great sandworm. As well as to get closer to other worlds, the dead ancestors in these rites of initiation. This is where you see the work of my dad, is right here. He taught me to be one-on-one -on -one with the snake, to be at one with it, to feel it in my fingers. The novice was ingurgitated by a totemic primordial animal that would regurgitate him in initiation. In other words, the mythical animal returns to life together with the initiate, symbolized by the covering of the self in the animal skins. The young one has gone out and proven they can first respect and then harness and direct the terrifying power of nature for their people. A related animal power initiation awaits Polytrates in Dune, a heavily K2-inspired work written by the Magamoon Frank Herbert and starring Magamoon Kyle MacLachlan in the 1984 version, a role reprised in the new film by Mullah's son, Magha ascendant Timothy Chalamet. He has a prophesized destiny to lead the Fremen, the desert people of the planet Arrakis, in a battle against the Empire. There are indestructible, deadly, massive sandworms on Arrakis. We're about to enter worm territory. We can't walk like regular humans. If we do, we're dead. We'll have to walk like the Fremen do. It's called a sand walk. Follow me. Do the sand moves. Secretly, the Fremen have mastered a way to ride the sandworms using master hooks. Learning to worm ride is a coming of age initiation ritual among the Fremen, and Paul Atreides must go through this richly symbolic test to harness his inheritance of obtaining desert power and stepping fully onto his dharmic path. This idea is also inherent in the concept of the Vahana, the special animal mount or vehicle of each divine being. Taming and directing a creature, it's symbolized that the deity has this kind of control over the Mulhara forces, their animal body, and the ability to integrate and use their own kundalini life force energy powerfully in service to their unique sacred function. Inherent in each powerful being is their past, or the area they've mastered and trampled over. The Vahana symbolizes the unruly traits they've tamed and completely overcome, a feat which has become the base for their inhuman level of power. The Vahana represents the antithetical force that makes the conditions of the deity's existence possible. Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance, rides an owl symbolizing poverty. Her cosmic purpose of producing wealth requires reigning in and dominating over the force of poverty. The large, focused Ganesha rides upon the small, scurrying rat, just as I explored how he holds a goad and has the purpose of taming the mind. He crushes useless thoughts, which I quote, multiply like rats in the dark. This also shows how he has mastered cosmic smallness to obtain the condition of largeness. In the height of K2 ruled nakshatras entering the liberation stage, this overarching idea becomes most important. One closing note before the next section is that this indication
application of mastery over one's animal strength is of course also present in what I've touched on before, Mula being a primary nakshatra known for bodybuilders. This is fittingly said to be the birth nakshatra of the heroic warrior god Hanuman. His alternative names include things like Kapishwara, lord of monkeys, Mahabala, the strongest one, and Mahakaya, gigantic. And not many people know, but he had like orangutan hands. I mean, they were huge. One of the primary symbols of the god Hercules were his muscles. You have to continue to grow. Now that's more like it. Bill compared Hercules' strength to the one who had the most potential before him, if not for his weakness, Achilles. And then there was Achilles. Now there was a guy who had it all. The build. The foot speed, he could jam, he could take a hit, he could keep on coming. A warrior demigod portrayed famously in Troy by the Mula Sun native Brad Pitt. In both Moana and the Scorpion King, Dwayne Johnson plays a physically powerful demigod, all roles relating to their inhuman level of strength. I know it's a lot, the hair, the bod. When you're staring at a demigod Physical strength shows a mastery over the Muladhara center that is required to be the apex predator and to be able to protect oneself and move the ignorance of the pigs and fishes of reality Magnificent looking creature, big, stocky, sturdy, Arnold Schwarzenegger type mammal with the elephant as the creature of this chakra, they symbolically wield and tame this outside of themselves, as well as frequently harnessing and mastering their own potential for bodily strength and size. Many of the most famous bodybuilding workout routines, helping other men or women to try to access their own physical power, are inspired by mula men. Do you keto, by the way? You look like you keto. No. No. No, yeah, <laughs> you don't need it. Such as the Fight Club workout craze, the 300 workout, the workouts of the Mula Moon native Pavel. On your left is Hercules Villa. Our next stop is the Pex and Plex gift shop, where you can pick up the great hero's 30-minute workout scroll, Buns of Bronze. And of course, one of the most influential bodybuilders of all time, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who helped make bodybuilding into a professional sport. I'm gonna check in with my office, I'll be right back when we do, we're gonna work on opening those hips. So now returning to Beauty and the Beast, Belle is now captive in the Beast's enchanted castle, deep in the forest, as he looks upon her adoringly, and Andaro is captive in the oversized but gentle hand of Kong. At this point in the story, Belle attempts to escape from Beast's castle. As she's making her way through the forest, she's confronted by a pack of wolves. <laughs> Beast, who has been stalking her from a distance, appears behind her. As strong as these wolves but directed towards her protection, rather than in a state of unhinged destruction. Belle's attitude towards him shifts, and after he's injured, instead of allowing her captor to die, she returns willingly to the castle with him to nurse him into health. This experience is mirrored in King Kong, where Kong protects Anne from dinosaurs and keeps her safe on the treacherous island. A scene shows Anne's similar shift in perspective regarding the beast here. So intrigued by the primal force used in her favor, now instead of running away from the beast, she begins running towards him. Mowgli, played by a double mula native in Disney's live-action version of The Jungle Book, is saved from one fearsome creature by another fearsome creature all throughout his story. Mowgli, behind me. Don't leave my side. In Mula Ascendant Wes Craven's film Swamp Thing, a woman is rescued from attackers by a monstrous creature. The Swamp Thing then takes her back to his lair and protects her from further harm. This monster versus monster is a rather constant theme leading to romance in Twilight, the series by the Mula native Stephanie Meyer, which I'll explore more later on. You're not the first monsters I've met. Jake's right, you're good with weird. In countless other scenes, even when the beast isn't protecting the Mula native, they recognize the immense power of the creature when they see it easily destroy another apex predator. So now, both Belle and Anne enter into more complex communication with their respective beasts. Anne starts utilizing symbol hand gestures and words to start to direct and teach him, Beautiful. While Belle models respectable behaviors for him and reads to him. 
Through this taming and teaching process, the Mula native's resistance to the beast starts to waver, and they have a slow awakening to realizing their passion for dealing with such forces. There's something sweet and almost kind, but he was mean and he was coarse and unrefined, and now he is dear and so unsure. I wonder why I didn't see it there before. The fierce creature starring Mula Ascendant Jamie Lee Curtis and Holiday in the Wild starring the Mula Moon native Kristen Davis both follow cynical or disillusioned city women who, by chance, are placed in a situation around a wild animal. One in a zoo with a gorilla. God, he's so male. Yamo, look. Isn't he wonderful? And the other on safari with an elephant. I'm going with him. What do you know about elephants? Almost nothing. The experience unearths a buried passion and new sense of purpose in both of them. Each woman completely reevaluates her life and career choices and decides to, from then on, center their lives around wild animals. It's um weird. You like hang out with animals more than people. They get me. Animals like you, they lick you. They don't like you, they eat you. You always know where you stand. Think about elephants. They read your soul. You never get any of those type of surprises. You don't wake up one day and someone doesn't love you anymore. Well, clearly, I'm with the wrong species. <laughs> Similarly, an in instinct, Mula Moon Anthony Hopkins initially begins as a primatologist on a research trip to Africa. However, studying the gorilla community, he is emotionally drawn in. I like them. I even needed them. He works to win the trust of the alpha male and is eventually welcomed into their social structure, an honor that leads him to abandoning his human life completely. She's not going. She's in love. She told you that? Uh, don't flatter yourself. It's not you. He has a gray trunk, weighs 600 pounds, and he has a drinking problem. Yeah, I guess I never saw that coming. in the wilderness with a jungle man. I should be terrified that no one will ever find me, but I'm not. In these works, the Mula native begins as hesitant or afraid, but gradually forms a bond with the creature due to what they mutually bring out of one another. Through the profoundly subduing Mula energy, the creature begins to become more tamed and directed. The Mula native therefore gains insight into the being that others who had no taming power couldn't see. Woo, she's starting to settle down now. Get off me. Nice and quiet. Look at her. What a beauty. I'd call it her because I'm in love with her now. Just as Belle becomes aware of the softness and humanity hidden in the rough animal and tormented exterior. Through this process, in addition to her new outlook on the beast, she discovers this significant cosmic power and function that had been dormant within her. I had an extraordinary experience. What sort of experience? With him. Possibly understand. I don't turn you on anymore because you've got the hots for a gorilla! Ah! It's not sexual. Well I have explored before how K2 ruled Nakshatra natives can struggle in the modern world in various ways due to their impulsivity, lack of self-awareness, fearlessness, and uninhibited behavior that would benefit them amongst nature and animals. Now remember, Kate, first analyze the situation. Don't just barrel in there without thinking. <laughs> These same traits can make them seem wild, brash, or uncontrolled within the fabric of society. Tristan's always been wild. You love him for that. Yeah, I suppose I do. Ancient cultures had more involvement and reliance on natural and animal products, hunting, transporting, and training of wild animals for various purposes like war. Very healthy. Over time, humans have become more and more removed from nature and oriented towards the artificial. There was previously more emphasis on these individuals' special ability to direct, rein in, and domesticate natural wild forces to perform tasks. In that way, K2 is connected to the oldest traditions that sustain civilizations at the root. You have strength. You shall be known as Usul, which is the strength of the base of the pillar. Through the harmonious harnessing of nature for our survival. In modern times, then, K2 Nakshatra natives can feel they have trouble fitting into society. You're perfect. Look at you. You're the saddest girl I've ever met. You're gonna make them weep, Anne. You're gonna break their hearts. Feeling like a force of nature entering into and trying to function in a tamed and artificial world where they do not always have a strong power center or blatantly common purpose. The villagers say that I'm a funny girl, but I'm not sure they mean it as a compliment. 
I'm sorry. The animated film The Croods actually depicts all of this in an oddly perfect way. It focuses on a family of cave people with a K2-world patriarch, Grug, voiced by the Mullen native Nicolas Cage. When most cave families have died due to the harsh conditions of their prehistoric time, theirs lives on due to Grug's Herculean physical strength against the massive beasts. The Croods made it because of my dad. He was strong. And his total adherence to the grounding of the old ways. The curious little bear wanted to climb to the top. <gasps> and no sooner than she climbed to the top, she saw something new and died. Grug teaches his family to fear and destroy anything new. Same ending as every day. <laughs> I get it, Dad. I get it. I will never do anything new or different. Good man, Thunk. His daughter, Eep, meets an innovative boy, Guy, who has discovered and harnessed fire, as well as constantly invents never-before-seen things like traps, sound amplifiers, and so on. He's voiced by the Swati Moon native, Ryan Reynolds. Makes it for me. Okay. Make. Does it make? Does it come out of me? Make. The K2 native who represents nature in the past is highly distrustful towards the boy, who represents the future and the movement towards the artificial. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? A place not like today or yesterday. A place where things are better. A place with more suns in the sky than you can count. Tomorrow isn't a place. It's, it's, it, you can't see it. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. I've seen it. That's where I'm going. But through the enticing pool of Rahu, the rest of his family become enthralled with Guy's inventions. We have to follow Guy now. With each new invention he shows them, Grug feels more lost, uncomfortably fixed, and useless. Initially, he tries to emulate the Rahu native. See, I got ideas. I got thoughts. But his inventions prove to be dangerous and silly. Where do you get these great ideas? Since I don't have a brain, they're coming from my stomach down deep below and then up again into my mind. It's only when he fully taps into his own power that he finds a strong way to contribute. I can't change. I don't have ideas, but I have my strength. When faced with a life-threatening challenge, at first he tries to think like Guy, Rahu, and come up with an invention. What would Guy do? What would Guy do? What would I do? Hold this. Instead, he leans into his own K2 capability to harness forces of nature under his command. Following the usual Mula storyline, throughout the entire film, a massive saber tooth had been relentlessly stalking him. At this point, he tames it instead, as well as harnesses the power of birds to fly them to safety. Douglas! Dad, you saved him! Well, a boy's gotta have a pet. Oh. Turns out, I'm a cat person. He passes this beast-taming skill to his family members, who each obtain an animal mount of their own, and this grants the family a level of safety against nature's destruction they'd never dreamed of previously. I'm the shield that guards the realms of men. Maybe that's enough. Such a base allowing for survival and protection leads me to another notion explored in the movie. While under her K2 father, the teenage daughter expresses that life does not feel worth living as it's only about survival. No one said survival was fun. Nothing is fun. That wasn't living! That was just not dying! There's a difference! After meeting Guy, the family starts to feel a sense of love for life. This ties to what I explored in my art series about Rahu and Venus being the entertaining and enjoyment-based planets which drive Maya. What is wrong with you? It was dangerous. It was beautiful! But it is K2 who supports any development of Rahu that is stable and lasting. With K2's foundational buffering from improper use of nature, there is danger nearby. We need to move to easier protected ground. Excesses like art, romance, stimulation, and so on are able to come into being, the fruits that make life feel worth living. I want romance, drama, sincerity. Move me. So the crude's message is about the importance of both Guy and Grug for the family's safety and well-being, the balance between the past and the future, nature and technology, tradition and innovation, the inhale of liberation, and the exhale of Maya. Now for a little contrast with MAGA, which as you've seen through this video, also arose in this area here and there. Right. You know. New York is considerably more interesting than I expected. Mula, of course, is the monster hunter or tamer, where K2 is complete and he goads and controls the largest beasts. In contrast, Magha is depicted more often recreationally, as being friends or caretakers of creatures, although there's some crossover. Merlin's beard? Dear fellow, how ever did you manage to kill it? Kill it? 
eldest friend he was. I'm writing a book about magical creatures. Like an extermination guide? No, a guide to help people understand why we should be protecting these creatures instead of killing them. Goldstein? The incredibly popular video game and cartoon franchise, Pokemon, was created by the Maka's son native Satoshi Tajiri. Yeah, Gligar, way to go! It centers around a player traveling around, collecting and befriending creatures, helping them grow, evolve, and gain experience. These monsters are used for the player's protection and increasing power. Hey, now start pulling us up as fast as you can! As he or she directs them to fight and capture other monsters. You rescue these creatures? Yes, that's right. Rescue, nurture, and protect them. I'm gently trying to educate my fellow wizards about them. The same concept is shown in the Harry Potter Fantastic Beasts installment. Caterpie! You're mine! which has been commonly described as Pokemon creatures in the Harry Potter universe. Eddie Redmayne with Magha Ascendant portrays Newt's commander. Hello. Hello. A magician passionate about magical creatures. He had a cold. He needed some body wash. Studying them and capturing them in his magic briefcase to keep them safe and nourished. The other primary magi zoologist explored in Harry Potter is, of course, Hagrid. You have to be trained up a bit, of course. <laughs> Hogwarts gamekeeper who breeds and protects the game, played by the Maka ascendant native Robbie Coltrane. Isn't he beautiful? Oh, bless him. Look, he knows his mummy. <laughs> I'm coming. Mum's here. Mum's here. Mummy's here. He's also the professor of the care of magical creatures for a time. Isn't he beautiful? Teaching people how to feed, maintain, and breed them. You have to let him make the first move. It's only polite. So, step up, give him a nice bow, then you wait and see if he bows back. In both Okja and Lilo and Stitch, a little Maka girl befriends a creature. 10,000 BC follows a Maka moon mammoth hunter who saves and befriends a beastly saber-toothed tiger. You must remember me. I gave you life who later also protects him in battle. The Disney classic Dumbo follows a little circus elephant with unusually large ears that allow him to fly. It was based on Magha Moon Helen Aberson's book, and the live action was directed by the Magha Sun native Tim Burton. He cast the Magha Ascendant Eva Green, who plays the trapeze artist who forms a special bond with little Dumbo. Eventually, she helps to free him into the wild by flying on his back and directing him to safety. We're wild animals! That's where we belong! That's right! Now in closing today's video, I will stop with Belle's resistance to Beast, falling to a new low as she watches him transforming under the chance she's giving him to become more elevated and refined. This arc of emotions found in both King Kong and Beauty and the Beast is encapsulated quickly and succinctly in parallel scenes in Harry Potter and the Wizard of Oz. In both, the Mulla woman encounters a beastly creature in the woods. For Dorothy, it's the lion tormenting her friends. In Harry Potter, it's Hagrid's giant brother, Grop. Like Kong, Grop has immediate interest in the Mula woman. He uncontrollably and impulsively grabs her into his oversized hand, evoking a scream. Quickly, she gathers herself and asserts her fearless taming power on the monstrous one. Put me down! Now! Shame on you! No! I said no! I told you to join me for dinner! And I told you no! In the same way, Kong is confused and taken aback when his scaring tactics do not move Andaro from her firm, brave assertion. You know, any living creature needs to know who's in charge. They can sense when a man's power is, shall we say, in full strength. Can't do anything with a bull without a bull hook, can you? And with it, you must claim the role of master immediately. For a few moments, he struggles against what he feels is the subdued submission building inside of him, but finally surrenders under her energetic direction. Anne, Hermione, and Dorothy each place herself where she belongs, atop the jungle hierarchy. Just needs a firm hand is all. That hurts! If you'd hold still, it wouldn't hurt as much! Displaying the inner fixity and courage that animalistic beings sense and obey. This is an idea contained within the famous Litany Against Fear in Dune. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer, and fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. A recitation Paul was taught to learn to control his mind even in the hardest of moments in order to properly wield his power. It's not fear that grips him, only a heightened sense of things. I'm not afraid. 
afraid of you. I quote Screen Rant, the goal of the litany against fear is to help the mind overcome the primal instinct to recoil or flee when facing pain or terror. When we touched, she didn't shudder at my paw. By controlling their emotional reactions, cultivating a still mind. When the worm approaches, you must be utterly still. In conquering fear, a person can remain aware and ready to strike at the real threat. Now, can you control your fear? According to the Bene Gesserit, humans incapable of surpassing their most basic instincts are doomed to be controlled by them, frozen and paralyzed by fear and unable to ascend to a higher level of consciousness. I hold at your neck a gomja bark. This one kills only animals. Your awareness may be powerful enough to control your instincts. Your instinct will be to remove your hand from the box. If you do so, you die. What's in the box? Pain. What is this? This is a chemical burn. Ah! Ah! It hurt more than you've ever been burned, and you will have a scar. What are you doing? Fear blinds animals and stops them from evolving. First, you have to know, not fear, that someday you're gonna die. You don't know how this feels. Thus, to truly be a master over beasts, one mustn't be confined under the same weaknesses. Careful. They could smell fear. Dancing with me doesn't scare you. Admit it. You're disgusted by my beastly body. You're terrified of my razor-sharp claws. I must admit, they're quite impressive. You know, most girls are afraid of bugs. But I'm not. In fact, I think you're kind of cute. A young goanna is going to be feisty. The fact that he could pull it out and that animal stayed calm in his hands tells me that his, his heart rate was down, Steve was in good shape, and then so it just transferred right on to the animal. With acknowledgement and respect for the display of this power, Grob sets Hermione down in submission. At this, her friends notice the giant has formed a deeper care for her. I think you've got an admirer. As a physically powerful being who is out of control of his own actions and steeped in animal ignorance, it is this direction, containment, and control asserted on him, what he craves and in what he finds relief. He turns around to retrieve his favorite bell and gifts it to her in hopes that she'll enjoy it. At this moment, you also see the transformative shift in Mula's perspective. Her heart melts for this monster, realizing its potential for goodness when placed under a taming force. She rings the bell, smiles approvingly, and her affection grows in return. This leads to the territory that the next videos will explore. Only she who tames can see the potential for beauty in such a beast, as it's only she who can bring it out of him. I hope you enjoyed this exploration. If this video was valuable to you in any way, some little interaction from you to show me that, whether a like or a comment or a subscribe, whichever you choose, really means a lot to me. Additionally, as most of you know, my videos are funded fully by you guys, not by YouTube or sponsors. So I could not devote the time and energy into creating these works if you guys weren't here on this journey with me. So the best current ways to get more of my content and to support these free videos include joining my Patreon community for updates and exclusive content, uh, checking out my ebooks. I also have some available spaces in my female path course where you can spend a year diving into the fascinating mysteries of the sacred feminine one-on-one -on -one with me. <laughs> Thank you to my amazing, generous patrons. The Ray Body level patrons are listed on the screen now. And extra love to my Abhijit level patrons, Ashley De La Cruz, Ray, Maddie DRX, Semya Hogan, Teresa Green, Tantric Tara, Crystal Perales, Eric Linden, Jazz, Nikki, Stephanie Cruz, Bella, E, Juliana Sons, TTHP, Murti, Tanya Allen, William Rivera, Monica Lewandowski, Ryan Loden, Cozy, Andrew Plays Piano, Aaron Shade, Anna R, Andrea Nicole, Ashley Rose, Masha, Ada Devu, Nexus, Antoine Sharp, Christina Solano, Ed Peterson, Emily Moon, Instant Numerology, Patrice, Rhett Panagetti, Haya, Alab X, Joanne Schultz, Nadia Samanich, and Sergi Polovenko. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys soon.